I'm James Milan, and welcome to this, an episode of uh, Justice in the Balance, which is our public affairs series here at ACMI that looks at justice in from a number of different prisons, from criminal justice to, in this case today, voting justice. And I am glad, very pleased, in fact, to welcome back to our studios Neil Osborne, who I had a lovely conversation with a couple of years ago as part of a different series, uh, but it's great to see you again and uh, we appreciate your being here. Now, Neil is here today uh, to speak, um, you know, as a, generally as a very learned person in this area, but also specifically because he is uh, currently on the executive committee of the Mystic Valley branch of the NAACP here in Massachusetts. Neil, first of all, let me ask, let me, again, thank you for being here. Um, but. I know that what I've just described as your current position within the NAACP is not all that you do. So right. why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you've got going on sure. professionally. Sure, James, thank you again for having me back on. Um, I guess I, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of my experiences. I don't know how learned I am, but we will see. Um, so my role at the NAACP, the Mystic Valley branch, now is on the executive committee. So there is a group of about 10 folks who actually meet more regularly than the general membership to help give guidance to the leadership. So before being on the executive committee, I was the branch president for almost a decade. So now I'm more into a mentoring role. Mm -hmm. The next generation is coming on. So I, I, I relish the older, more learned mm -hmm. <laughs> role in, in the organization. But also during the day, uh, my job now is I am the director of diversity inclusion for the city of Medford, and I, um, I have the privilege of doing my community work, but I bring along that city role that they are actively involved in making sure people feel welcome in the city of Medford. And we may have a chance to talk a little bit more about that as the interview wears on. But let me, uh, let me ask you first, um, and this is a bit of an aside, but before we get into the substance of the conversation, something that I have been curious about, and that has to do with the NAACP, and it's n that, that literally the name. Right. Uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm wondering is, have there, you've been at work with the organization for a while. Is yeah. there uh, a consciousness and awareness and a desire to rebrand that, given that, again, specifically I am struck right. when I think about it by the term colored people and how uh, how it seems to feel to, like it belongs to another time. You know, so, you know, James, I actually asked that question when I first arrived or started attending a branch meeting, oh, maybe 15, 20 years ago. And the, the name that I thought may be more appropriate would be the National Association for the Advancement of People of Color. But as you, uh, as you begin to work with local branches and the regional NAACP groups and you get to go to nationals, there is a great um, connection to the NAACP brand. And um, it, I guess it's steeped in history, it's steeped in the individuals who risked, risked life and limb. Um, so um, change would happen very slowly and anyone in this nation understands when you say the NAACP, they understand what that means. So maybe in the future there may be a rebranding, but I wouldn't expect it's going to be any time soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically just that that's what I would have imagined, that really it's just there's too, there's too much weight right. um, within NAACP as it, as it stands, and that would just, it's, it's not yet worth uh, do, making all the changes you'd have to. E exactly. All right, well, thanks for that. Um, I had mentioned at the outset that we are interested in talking about voting justice today. Mm -hmm. And um, before we bring that up to, um, to the contemporary moment and what that looks like or doesn't, um, I would love for you to give us a sense of what the historical context is for this. And what I mean by that specifically is, of course, this nation was born with the stain of slavery as part of it. And uh, people are generally aware of what the course of things have been over time since then. Right. 
But what I'm very interested in is the lingering effects of slavery, black codes, Jim Crow, et cetera, on it, how those things can linger long after perhaps the law changes or even maybe societal attitudes change. Right. So um, in 2019, we are reflecting on 400 years of um, enslaved people being brought to this country. It gives us a chance to reflect on how far uh, individuals and cultures have come to uh, be fully integrated and respected for the contributions of black people in this country. Unfortunately, when you have the weight and baggage in a history of dominating individuals to do the heavy, hard labor and almost not even respecting individuals as human beings, that has a long lasting and stigmatizing um, co uh, connotation to how we interact with each other. So I know when I'm talking to some of my uh, friends and colleagues, they, one of their concerns is, well, that happened a long time ago. But actually what happened a long time ago still remains. And I think when you bring up the context of voter rights, it's that history and challenge of white individuals who, um, for whatever means, took to um, steal someone else's labor uh, through brutality and threat and intimidations, that when it's time to recognize the constitution of this country, what we are, we've been, we, this nation was built on, this notion of uh, laws and uh, everyone is being treated equal, it, it, it still remains because individuals go out of their way to limit the opportunity for people who are not white to gain power. And it's in German, it's in rules that legislators, elected officials change the jurisdictional boundaries of who gets to vote when. It's in the discouraging of people uh, not to register to vote. And it's a whole bunch of different little subtle and some not so subtle things that say, okay, you're here. I guess the law says we have to respect you, but you know, we're going to tinker around the edges so we can hold on to power and pretend that everyone's equal. And there's some folks that are still around that will shine a light onto those actions that say, you know, what you're doing isn't right. We aren't going to stand for it and finding allies to fight against these challenges. Mm -hmm. And that, that has a lot to do with, you know, what the, let's say, the, the white majority or the white dominant population can impose, you know, and the ways in which we uh, can uh, allow this to happen in terms of, yes, the law has changed on its face, however, the application of it, the enforcement of it, et cetera, has allowed, again, for, uh, as, as you say, y y you know, white people in power to be able to curtail or outright deny um, th th these, these voting rights to populations of color. I am also interested, um, if you might comment, on the fact of, or the, the question of how much um, does the effect of long-term discrimination going all the way, and, and exploitation going all the way back to slavery, how much does that affect the consciousness within people of color so that they may not feel like they can exercise rights that they actually do have I think, or are granted? I think that's sort of the most insidious effect of uh, enslaved people being in this country is sometimes there are folks internally who think they have no chance, there is no way to fight back. And they accept that role of being someone else is gonna dominate, someone else is gonna make those decisions, someone else is going to be uh, holding me back or creating barriers and there's nothing that I can do. And I think um, sapping that energy of individuals I think is the most hardest and challenging thing that we need to recognize it's there. Uh, individuals of color need to say, you know, we need to sort of make sure our young people have uh, an idea and understanding that 
folks are fighting out there so those barriers will be removed. I wish I could say there are no barriers and young people don't worry about it, but it's important uh, not just for people of color to recognize we're not going to slip into that role of it's inevitable, but we have an opportunity to change. And voting is one of the strongest uh, tools that we could deploy to make sure that this nation lives up to the promise of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And you have already mentioned um, gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. um, just in case that we have audience members who aren't quite sure what that is, can you just explain what that process or what that tactic mm -hmm. is, um, and then of course what its effect is? Right. That is a um, how do I say the right word? A an, a tool used by uh, legislators who are elected to redraw the lines of uh, who will vote for local elected people. So for uh, example, your congressman or congresswoman, uh, there are certain districts. So if you can draw a district where there are uh, very few black people within that voting area, their power to elect someone that represents their interest gets sapped. So the power goes to the individuals who are drawing the maps, and it was a effective tool in limiting the ability for people of color to elect people to represent them. Yeah, in fact, the last couple of decades have seen, as far as I know, a very successful, somewhat stealthy campaign. Um, uh, re Republican legislatures uh, in states around the country who have very, again, successfully redrawn maps to ensure going forward um, a, a, a much less of, the, uh, of an opportunity for people of color to make their choices uh, count mm -hmm. um, and, and also, again, uh, not coincidentally increasing the opportunity for Republicans to continue uh, to win in these districts. I, I, I think that's a, a, an important point for us to emphasize. Why would any person or any group want to do that? It is totally uh, about power. It doesn't have to be some big convention of white people getting together or, or Republicans getting to say, hey, this is the strategy. They understand it works. Their people can get elected and re-elected if you draw maps around spaces that limit the opportunity for folks of color to gain legislative leaders. Well, and if you, because we've now touched on this, I can't help but ask and feel free to say, hey, this is a conversation for another day or uh, somewhere else. But uh, it does feel, you know, I, I said specifically this is Republican legislatures. Um, it, 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 there is that sense that as between Republicans and Democrats as a party, Republicans are both more willing to and much more effective at using these, these kinds of tools in order to increase and maintain power. Right. Um, do you see that as, um, if, if we are going to postulate just for the purposes of this conversation, that... Um, uh, the Democratic Party may better represent and align with uh, the aspirations and, and, and interests of people of color. If we just accept that for, for here, sure. do you feel like it's important that the De Democratic Party either change its approach to these kinds of things or in some way more effectively find a way to counter uh, what Republicans, again, have been able to do right there in the open mm -hmm. for uh, at least a couple of decades now. It is such a challenging tool. When it's used in the wrong way, it harms us all. So it's almost Democrats have to recognize you can't fight that same fire with that same fire. Uh, it needs better education. It needs sometimes lawsuits. It needs to challenge people's moral judgments. Like, why would you do this and you know the effect, the outcome, is to limit people of color? So it's a dangerous, dangerous process. And uh, we need to educate folks that it's not done to uh, help us all. It's done in a way to limit someone, to take what power they had and enhance someone else. You know, 
mentioning how important it is to educate people uh, reminds me of the fact that it's only, I think, maybe six years ago or so that the United States Supreme Court um, was looking at a voting uh, rights uh, uh, issue yes. and basically um, uh, found part of their conclusion was based on the idea that, hey, things have changed. Right, yes. That things are better now. That we don't have to worry about these things as much anymore. If you had a chance to educate, <laughs> yes, the Supreme Court around that, what 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 would you say? So, I I I actually read that case, the Shelby County, Alabama versus Holder, the Attorney General, um, the county of Shelby County in Alabama was challenging the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and one of their arguments was hey, guess what, since 1965, more people of color are registered, uh, people of color are, are now getting elected to office. How come now us, Shelby County, gets to be treated differently than any other place in the country? That doesn't seem right to us. But the problem was um, Shelby County was held to a strict standard that they couldn't change any voting um, provision without getting permission. So what they were arguing was, please stop requiring us to go get permission to make sure what we're doing isn't disenfranchising people of color. And they said, that's just too tiresome, too burdensome. Well, the reason why the burden was there, because people in Shelby County, well before 1965, were going out of their way to deprive U.S. citizens of color any opportunity to cast a vote. So, this Supreme Court decision, did we have nine justices, learned people, uh, scholars in the law, uh, heard a debate about whether or not Shelby County and other parts would be required to ask for permission. And the unfortunate result again, so the court ruled five to four that they were going to um, um, remove this requirement of asking for permission. The moment that decision gets passed, they're right there making those sort of changes that do uh, what they were doing well before 1965. They aren't claiming or, or standing up and say, hey, look, we're being racist and we're trying to, it's like, oh, we're trying to make it sh more fair. But what happens, uh, it's being less fair because the opportunity for non-whites to gain access to the ballot box is being restricted and it is to their benefit or some group's benefit that voting becomes more difficult. Voting is discouraged in a certain area and I think that is um, quite challenging, quite um, alarming and for folks who have the time and energy read that decision, uh, Shelby County versus Holder and read the dissent of Ruth Bader Ginsburg who um, lays it on the line about how uh, the five justices willing to um, roll back protections now is um, not the right place that we want to be. Yeah, it sounds to me, and, uh, and I bet that we could find many, many other examples uh, that, that kind of are analogous to Shelby County. Mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like the, the argument that was perhaps being made by the attorneys for Shelby County and accepted ultimately by the Supreme Court is this was, that was true before 65, th then things changed, <laughs> right? As soon as you have law, then okay, everything changes. And then we have some data to show that things have, have improved. So therefore, we don't need anybody monitoring us anymore. Right. And as I think what you said is the ef actual effect of that has been to remove the monitoring and to see evidence that there is a return yeah. uh, to pre-1965 type uh, activity uh, on the county level. Un un unfortunately, that's true and people are getting uh, very creative about their process. They're creating new ways, but the end effect if it means people of color are marginalized, we're, 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 we're designing things unnecessarily that takes rights away. As, and that's not the America that I think a lot of us want to, want to believe exists and that we're a part of. All right, so uh, I think a viewer who's been following this conversation so far um, is apt to be, and reasonably so, 
rather depressed <laughs> at this moment because you know what we're talking about is um, ostensible progress uh, kind of disguising um, just the ongoing cycles of, of uh, you know, frankly, oppression um, as we see them in this sphere. So let me ask you, Neil, um, are there any places or stories in the country at the moment um, that are encouraging, that are where, where you see and the NAACP sees that there is, you know, that there is progress, real progress <laughs> being made? Uh, I guess I would start with uh, the NAACP uh, in and of itself. The fact that that organization is 110 years old, we are active uh, here the Mystic Valley branch, we are active in the state, we are active around the country. And I can assure you we are not asleep at the wheel. We have some learned, well-educated folks who are fighting legal battles uh, where we can. We are out there making sure people get registered to vote. When we start telling people, guess what? They're trying to purge you from the voter rolls so that you have no voice. We want you to pay attention. Some people are paying attention. Some people are getting to the polls. More people are being registered. So we are happy that their actions are forcing us to be energized, but I guess we're hoping that maybe that we didn't have to <laughs> force people to get energized, but um, we are not asleep at the wheel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, speaking of, per that's a perfect segue, you, you may know it or you may not, but not asleep at the wheel is perfect for what I want to ask you about, which is clearly the NAACP in this state is not asleep at the wheel because uh, just this last week or two has seen the passage of a hands-free uh, you know, law related to the fact that people can no longer be uh, you know, holding their phones in their hands if they are going to be speaking or using their phones in their cars, et cetera. Yes. Um, I think legislation that has taken a while to wend its way through uh, through the state house, and um, something that people in general uh, are quite supportive of for yeah. obvious reasons. There are real public safety benefits to to the law, obviously. However, the NAACP has pointed out that there's a whole other series of considerations. Yes. So why don't you lay that out for us? Sure. So I, I, I will share that uh, Emily Klein, a Medford resident, a friend of mine, uh, has long been in that battle for um, getting this bill passed. Unfortunately, her father was killed by a distracted driver, and for years she has lobbied people to pay attention that these aren't uh, accidents, they're crashes. and. Um, we have had some very deep discussions about the NAACP's concerns because um, the biggest concern that um, we have was that it was that bill, if not properly written, would give police officers the chance to pull over people of color for no other reason but than being a person of color. So for a long time, there were legislators of color, and I know the, um, the New England Area Conference, which is the, the group of uh, uh, NAACP branch leaders that provide leadership to the local branches, had um, not been supportive of that bill as it had been written. And we put a lot of pressure on legislators to change uh, the reporting part of the process. Um, there are still people in the NAACP locally that think the bill did not go far enough, that there should be more uh, reporting of who gets stopped. My understanding of the bill that passed and got signed is that any time a ticket is issued, then they're going to uh, save that data. But um, a lot of progress has been made. We understand the bill, it will actually save lives by forcing people to put down their phones and be less distracted. But we also, each and every one of us, has to be mindful that for a long time, police officers were pulling people over for no other reason and that, that could be explained, but they look different. And that's not the nation that we want to be. So are you saying, though, that, that this just gives p police officers who would be inclined to do that, to get somebody on a DWB, a driving while black, um, uh, that this just gives them another tool or another excuse uh, with which to do that? Or is there something specifically about hands-free 
um, that, that would open a door to, to more of this? No, we were simply looking at the history of the data that says we know there are there's a, the police force in Massachusetts, unfortunately, does not represent the population here. So right away, we're at a disadvantage. So if white officers want to police slightly different and be more stringent on people of color, they have a badge, they have uh, a gun, they have that. They have the authority. They have the authority. And the NAACP questioned the language to say, do they need another tool? And if you're going to create this tool, we really need to be well, have some safeguards because the history of the data tells us black drivers get more scrutiny than white drivers. Um, so lastly, uh, let me ask you just to, to again focus on the state <laughs> and the fact that your own um, experience over a lot of years now with the NAACP has happened within Massachusetts, right? right? Yes. Um, my sense is that the NAACP is fighting battles <laughs> all over the country um, and that there are states in which uh, its relationships with the state apparatus um, are, are, are tough. Mm -hmm. um, how, how is it in Massachusetts? Uh, I think most of us would like to believe that this is a, uh, you know, a state which is, uh, you know, a, a collaborator, right. a willing uh, collaborator with and who are going to be listening to concerns raised by the NAACP in situations such as we've just been talking about. Is that, is that what you have found to be the case? Or? Um, yes, but it boils down to relationships. It's the ability to uh, meet someone over a table, you can shake their hands, you can hear, um, their, uh, hear where they can explain where they may disagree with you, and they can hear you when you explain how you can disagree with them. It also means that the elected leaders, that they begin to look more like the community. So having more and more women and Latinos and uh, people of color running for office and getting elected means that the leaders who are listening to us begin to change. So yes, in the sense that I've been a part of um, discussions or meetings with high level uh, individuals based on my tenure with the NAACP, but there's still more work that needs to be done. It's always um, finding ways to create that relationship that says, hey, I'm the local branch president of the NAACP. Madam Mayor, can I come talk to you about this issue? And that takes some time, mm -hmm. but we are, we are at it. <laughs> okay, so very last question. Um, given the fact that you have experience and you also, I'm sure, have opinions around the situation as, uh, as local as working with the branch of the NAACP with local entities, mayors, et cetera, <laughs> to the state level and then looking at the federal, at what's going on on the federal level. How optimistic or pessimistic are you looking out the next year, two years, five years uh, uh, about the issues that matter most to you and your membership? Uh, you know, where, where do you fall? I guess I came out of the room an optimist. So. Um any challenge is an opportunity to create the reality that you want. So uh, for me, I think um, uh, a year from now, the uh, national presidential elections, uh, I think will sort of draw people's attention. Uh, unfortunately, the current uh, person in the, the White House tends to um, draw these distinct lines. But by doing that, folks who are paying attention are saying, okay, we need to get registered, we need to talk to folks, we need to talk to more people about the issue. I think the, uh, one of the greatest uh, joys of the job that I have as Director of Diversity and Inclusion for the City of Medford, I get to talk about race with people and try to create situations where um, I'm not forcing it down their throats or telling them they're wrong or their beliefs are wrong. I'm showing them that our future is in our diversity. 
embracing that and sometimes having uncomfortable conversations about race will get us to where we need to go. So I am absolutely optimistic and hopeful that um, this nation is going to get better. And it gets better locally, it gets better uh, uh, by the state, it gets better regionally, but um, as long as there are folks like y yourself who are willing to uh, educate and uh, make sure people know what's out there, I I'm in the fight. I have a young daughter and she is uh, becoming a young activist herself, so um, I, I have high hopes. Well, you said it. <laughs> Our future, as you say, is in our diversity. That is true aspirationally and that is true literally. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, so let us hope that we can recognize that and that can kind of inform much of the way that we move forward with legislation, just with the way that we treat each other going forward. So I'm happy to join the optimism, uh, the optimism bandwagon for the moment. I appreciate very much you being here uh, for this conversation. It was a real pleasure. James, again, thank you for having me on. Thank you, sir. Um, for Neil Osborne, who again is part of the executive committee of the Mystic Valley branch of the NAACP, just the latest of a number of positions he's held with the organization. Um, and on behalf of our series, Justice in the Balance, I'm James Milan. We appreciate your being here.